tiger on the prowl. I'ma make it go wild. I'm original, and I told you so. I'm a kid in the candy store with the leather on the denim. I ain't the cure, I'm the venom. If you wanna find me, find the tail lights. Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye. It's time to go. It's time to go. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Don't blink, don't blink. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Don't blink, don't blink. I don't wait for nobody. I'ma sign my name on the dotty. City lights call my name, drawn to the flame, and I'm feeling kind of naughty. I hit the ground running, step out the door and I'm stunning. Better hold tight, cause you know what's going down. I'm setting the pace, cause this is my town. So get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Hey, 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 what up Wednesday? Good to see you. Keely Dunn, FH Empires. I am so glad you're joining me today. It is kind of getting back to normal, except it's absolutely not getting back to normal. Let's talk about these things and more today. Today, we are going to cover the new aerial ball guidance, which might be something that comes around to you as you start up your new seasons. For those of you who are concluding your seasons, like me, uh, concluding outdoor for league, but still going with university. For those of us who are doing that, we can still get a lot out of this and think about what we're going to be doing for the next season as we get in, or maybe your summer hockey, if you're down in the Southern hemisphere, you know, back there, down there in the Southern, whatever, you know how we roll. Uh, we are then going to cover the new, uh, guidance in regards to diving that's correct. We're going to talk about that. And then I wanted to go through a question that good friend of the show, Simon Webb brought to me. And that's how do you work with an umpire coach or manager that you don't agree with? Basically. So we've touched on this a little bit in past shows, but I think it's a really good topic. And I think there's a lot of good conversation we can have again about it and maybe come up with some new ideas. So that's what we're doing today. I'm going to see who's here in the comments and such. I am um, using a different, slightly different audio setup. So yeah, that's, I'm, I'm just looking at my mic lights because they're giving me information that I don't understand. Just saying it's there. Let's see if I can play this. I am going to play my instrumentals track in the background, maybe. Let me know if you can hear it. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on here. Ecamm mic looks to be at good levels and I'm trying to play instrumental music in the background with this. Although I can't hear it, it's not routing through my mic. Luke's given me a thumbs up, so hopefully that's working and it's not overshadowing my voice. Let me know. Andrew Wright's here. Hi. Okay, let me go through the comments and see. Niels was first. Good to see you, Niels. Rachel, as always. Simon, you're going to catch up later because you just got back from up -paring. Totally understandable. Gotcha. But uh, as always, my right arm. I look forward to getting getting my, my arm back. Ian is on time today. Well played, sir. Well played. Let me, let me see. Wait. 
Yeah. Uh, Florian's here. Good to see you, friend. Uh, Luke, as I mentioned earlier, evening, everybody. And Lucio is here with his adorable poodle abra, poodle doodle, something. Simon Webb's here so he can listen to the answers to his question. We can have a good discussion about that. Uh, Rachel is on the cab, so nice to know. Good to have you. And glad you're enjoying. And I'm going to put that right above my buy me a coffee link down here. So if you're not a regular around here and maybe this is one of your first broadcasts or something like that, very warm welcome. Make sure you say something in the comments so that we can give you the proper third team hello because that's what we do. Um, if you're not aware, there's a few ways that you can support what we do with FH Empires. And one of them is just, you can you can buy me a, a rosé, but it's buymeacoffee.com forward slash FH Empires. And uh, that is a nice low commitment way to express your appreciation and to get us keep, uh, get us to keep continuing. No, to get us to continue to keep presenting all this great umpiring education. Um, thanks very much, Niels, for the reminder on the like button. That's great. I, you know, it's even better if you listen for a while and then you like it because then YouTube says, oh yeah, this person really has appreciated and taken in some of this content. So that's, that's what I read. That's what I read on the internet. And I believe everything I read. Um, yeah, Luke is back. Andrea is here. The sound is okay, but maybe a bit loud. Ooh, I have it like super low. Um, let's see. I turn that down even more. Let me know. Um, Yope's here. Hi, friend. Richard Dunmore. Hello. I, th I think you've been here a couple times, but I haven't seen you for a while. So welcome back. And yes, as Neil mentioned, there's also a third team membership that you can look at. If you're interested, I'm going to press the button, but it's been causing me problems. So there you go. Um, let's see if this is actually going to vanish off the screen. It does. So $3 a month. It's just $3 a month. You can help us going. You, you won't even notice it coming out of your credit card or your bank account. It's like, it's not even there. And <laughs> just, it, it's practically paying for itself. Uh, that's a great way to do it. We also have our yellow mentoring memberships that uh, for $17 a month, you can join a whole bunch of us in watch parties, huddles, access, the full access to the clip library and all kinds of great stuff like that. So think about that if you are gearing up for a new season or you want to spend some time in your off season in the Southern Hemisphere, getting ready for the next uh, place to go. So there you go. Stefan is one of our new, let's see, let me put him up on the screen. Uh, Mari Ora Kutu. I hope I said that right. It's great to have you, Stefan. He's one of our newest green members. So thank you very much, Stefan, for signing up and showing your support. Uh, much, much appreciated. So um, let's see, what announcements do I have? I just want to encourage everybody, if you haven't had a chance yet, to make sure you head over to the Discord because that is where we do all the things. Uh, this is where we partake in a lot of our informal discussions. We get stuff straight. Let me see, I'm trying to, trying to size this properly for the window there. Um, we can... Uh, we, we can rehearse and sort of hash out a few points that I might bring into the live stream. And it's also where all the yellow and green, whoops, membership activities go down. Okay. So we do our watch parties in here and our huddles. And occasionally I invite the green members to join in those as well, especially during tournaments where we can have really great conversations like that. So um, there you go. That is a good place to go hang out and we'd love to see you there. It's so much easier to engage there than on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. It just provides a better setting for media communication like that, that everybody can engage in and it's searchable 
Friends, it's searchable. You can plug in your terms and you can search just say the Ask FHU thread, or you can search like the entire Discord and you can find other conversations and topics that you're interested in and maybe follow up on something that you read. So give that a try. Okay, let's get into the jam. Um, Nils, thank you so much for this. Uh, he's been, Nils has been in the shop and he's been into the merch and he's grabbed some, uh, some few items. There are whistles and bags and a few pieces of clothing that I'm still working on. So there you go. Let's talk about aerials and the new interpretations. So this came up on the Discord server because uh, one of uh, our good members, Alex, was getting ready to present to his uh, group. And I'm just changing my camera angle because I don't like it. There we go, that's bad. Um, he was getting ready to present the new information to his group and he had some really good questions, particularly on interceptions. So I wanna focus on that small area about aerials today and how that's changed under the new international briefing. And it could possibly, there might be some guidance in the new rule book that will come out for 2022 that reinforces the concept. I'm not sure yet. I just, I, I don't know how the rules committee wants to handle this. I just know that they're, they're considering it. Okay. So that's there. Oh, Stefan, thank you. Not a bad pronunciation. It seems to be very, uh, phonetic, the, the, the Maori stuff. And I do have some friends down there, so clearly it's rubbed off. Um, it's Maori language week. Thank you. That's great. Good to know. I love it. Okay. So let me show you if I can, yes. So this is a slide from the Tokyo 2020, as you can see, boop, right up there, the briefing. And this was also repeated in the Euro briefing. So this is getting embedded in the, um, in all the FIH standard. And what should be happening is that we all take this, this mandate and it filters down through all the levels. Now we all know that we all play an umpire and coach at wide varieties of levels, but what I try to reinforce every time that we're together here is that the principles are the same. It's the facts that differ. So you don't apply different rules at different levels. You apply the different facts that you see in front of you to the principles that stay the same all the way throughout. And those principles are such that even you, you might not have that interpretation needed at your level because that fact just doesn't exist. So for example, if you're umpiring under eights, under tens, <laughs> something like that, you're probably not seeing any aerials. So the whole section about aerials doesn't matter to you that much. You need to know it. but you're not going to be applying it because the facts just don't even exist in your game. That doesn't mean you're applying a different set of rules. So I hope you understand that distinction. And I think that's really important for us to get our heads wrapped around because that leads us into the next concept about how, how there are different interpretations for different fact situations because different spirit comes involved in it. That's okay. So, um, this, is the first slide to do on the briefing. And that's very interesting. I'm hearing a whole bunch of buzzing in my ears and hopefully that's not all on you. Oh, hey, Alex is here. So he's here for his, his topic. That's awesome. Um, so you might remember time and we're gonna go through this scenario, this clip together. Um, where we saw an interception that a lot of people didn't understand why it was allowed to play on. And that was like, that was one of the main drivers. That one play was one of the main drivers behind this. And it's the concept that balls can be safely intercepted before they fall to the initial receiver. Okay. So one of the weirdness things that we got into when we started applying the aerial rule is that we made it a very, very, very static thing. 
in that we expected that as soon as the ball was launched, nobody moved, everybody stopped, nobody moved, and whoever the ball was being aimed at, accidentally or not, or intentionally, they were the person who were to receive the ball. And that fact was immutable and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And when you think about it, that's crazy talk. That doesn't make sense with how the game is actually played. So as we've seen more exceptional instances and understandings, we've realized that interceptions should be allowed so long as they're safe. And this has been a constant cry of the top coaches and the top players saying, would you just let us play as long as it's safe? We get it that you want to protect us, but stop getting in our way. So that was one of the intercepts on here. So when they set out rule 9.10 there, that players must not approach within five meters of an opponent falling, uh, receiving a falling raised ball until it is received, it has been received, controlled, and is on the ground unless they can safely intercept the ball in the air. That's probably what's going to be going in the rule book. And hopefully that will, that will help us. So what we're looking at is that section, that second bullet point there, where a player approaching from outside the five meters can legitimately intercept the ball in an uncontested situation in which players of opposing teams are not within playing distance of each other and the interception does not cause the playing distance between such players to be reduced. Oops. So that is, um, hopefully that'll explain things. I'm on the wrong slide here, so just give me a second so I can get the um, play presenter display because I want to show a couple of examples from here, but let, let me show you the, the the big one that was from the Men's World Cup that really got the discussion going about how interceptions need to be allowed. Goal. Look at this. Yeah, the ball comes out from there. There's four passes, Brand. This is a lovely pass. Wonderful pass. Look at Ockenden's job. He brought it down. There's the pass. Six touches, seven, eight touches, and it's a goal at the other end of the field. So you can see it was a it was a high electric moment. It was incredibly dynamic, but a lot of people didn't understand. Van Ass was underneath the ball. Why didn't he get to receive it, <laughs> basically? And it's because the interception came from a safe space, did not reduce the playing distance between the two players. If it was exactly five meters or it was a little less, it didn't matter because it was still safe. And when you look at the, the, the direct up-the-pitch angle on that play, you can see that there was a significant amount of playing distance that it didn't appear it was on the side angle. So understanding that the players aren't standing perpendicular to each other or parallel to each other or in these nice straight lines that everything sort of shifts, in general, you can say without a shadow of doubt that that was a safe interception on that play. And so they're trying to codify that to a certain extent in the new guidance and the new interpretations, okay? If you have any questions so far, please chime in the comments because this is an interactive discussion and I wanna make sure that I'm getting all that straight. Now, I do have an example of a non-safe interception somewhere here. Uh, let's see, do, 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 do. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, should be this one. Okay. And I will put on the scene. How's that looking? Eh, it could be worse. 
There. How's that? Okay. So here's an example of an interception that closes the space and is not a safe and legal interception. Okay. And this is directly from the briefing. Are. So Australia getting the one goal when they had the player advantage. Level now. Just over nine minutes left. Well, play on was the call as Davies brought that one down in the air ahead of Georgia Wilson and yeah. played into the foot of Wilson by Mickelson. Means penalty it's corner, New Zealand. It's into the place. They both go in. Fight. There's nobody at the beginning of the fight. And that was Davies doing a good run, and Mickelson. Okay, so you can see there's a difference between those two situations. And it was difficult because of the angles at which the players were moving and where the umpire was, that the it appeared that there was more space than there was, or the assumption could have been made that there was more space than there was actually in that instance. But the spacing between the players was closed. It actually wasn't safe, and so that's still a case where the initial receiver should be allowed to control the ball with five meters of space. Okay, so one thing that I did do to sort of prepare for this discussion was I went through all the Olympic clips because, I unfortunately, I can't show Olympic clips on What Up Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks, IOC. But the, the, I, I went to look for instances where this principle was applied and it worked out and there was a safe interception in the air. And you know what? I found a lot of unsafe interceptions and, and no safe interceptions in everything that I'd cataloged. doesn't mean it didn't happen because there's a couple games I wasn't able to still haven't watched or analyzed thoroughly yet, but I didn't see them myself. So it's not an, a, a, it's, it's actually, it's interesting to me that this was something that we got a lot of feedback on and a lot of players complain about. And then when you get the best players in the world on the biggest stage, they're, they're not able to execute the skill safely, safely to the point that you think, well, yeah, we really need to have this exception to allow that play in the rule book. So that aside, keep that in mind that this is going to be something that evolves very slowly up from the back. It's going to take a while for players to understand what is, what could be safe and what isn't safe. And you're still going to need to make your decision with, as the briefing says, with 20 meters, let's see if I've got the right one here. Um, while the ball is 20 meters from the point at which it's going to be received, which is hard. And it's not that you don't make any decisions. Okay. I think we, we misinterpret this little section and we think, okay, I'm going to wait until the ball's 20 meters away before I decide who the initial receiver is. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. Um, actually what you should be thinking about is when the ball has been sent and is in the, in midair that you are going to be, um, you're going to be making your decision early and then checking to see whether an interception could be safely made. You're watching and waiting on your whistle to allow that safe interception still. But if it isn't, then you're ready to make your call. Does it mean we're going to be waiting longer? Yeah. This is what the players want at a lot of levels. Okay. So keep that in mind when you're looking at that uh, 20 meters 20 meter decision point and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see where we're at in the comments so I can address some questions as they're coming in. Um, let's see, Richard Dunmore, it only works if the umpire's in the right place. Yes. And I do a lot of talking about this in the mission critical positioning workshops that I do. And whenever I'm coaching and managing is that the right space is not going to be out on the sideline in the traditional old school, uh, method that actually you're going to be looking at being ahead of the play inside the play vertically with everything that's happening. So you're absolutely right, Richard. That's, that's very important. And because the umpire in that situation just happens to be Dan Barstow, who is a former, um, 
who's a guest on Umpire at Home, and I will put a link in the description or into a card to his interview where we talked about positioning and the importance of being deep and being closer to your happy place and being inside and being ahead of the play, not just like in advance on a 45 degree angle. That's not good enough anymore. No, 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 no more, no more. We have to have to be ahead of it and inside much more like, I don't know, it's kind of almost like football refereeing in a way in terms of how interior we are when the ball is coming towards our attack. And yes, so Dan was actually the umpire who, who made that decision. And he was only able to see that and see that angle in that moment because he was in the right place. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> James, I don't know how watching me on two times speed is going to work out for you. Am I twice as cute? I don't think so. That might be, uh, that might be a little rough. Yeah. Very creative. Thanks, Niels. Uh, let's see, Florian, there'll be so much confusion at the lower levels with this because the umpire will have to let play and can't prevent the dangerous situations with a quick, easy whistle. Okay. So let's address that point because that's something that came up in the discussion with Alex as well, is that Remember, as I said, you still want to make the decision right away as to whether there is an initial receiver or not. So balls that are coming towards more than one player and you cannot declare an initial receiver early enough, you can still make those quick decisions. You can still blow your whistle quickly and clear up that aerial and stop that, stop con contests from happening within small spaces. But what you will be doing at levels of play that, ha that players have the skill, which isn't a lot of them right now, but the only way players can develop skill is to actually do them in games. So we're not going to stop them from trying, <laughs> but they have to do it safely where a, a player can attempt to intercept with ample space with around five meters in between in clear space so that the interception is safe. So you wouldn't have blown your whistle anyway early if you saw an initial receiver. So you're, you're not preempting anything anyway. You're just saying, okay, there's the initial receiver, but you're allowing for the chance because it, it was an incorrect process in our minds. We saw the initial receiver, like that's the person who's getting the ball. No, they may not get the ball because they may be intercepted, right? Do you see the difference between that? So what we were doing was we were incorrectly sometimes applying the thought process that, well, the ball has to go to that person that I'd set in my mind was the initial receiver at the outset of the launch. Okay. So there's a bit of a difference. And I still think, Florian, you're going to be okay with making sure that those balls into a crowd, you're still going to be able to call early. Okay. Stefan. So the dangerous interceptions should in general go to the intended receiver or who closes the difference, the initial receiver. <laughs> we don't use the word intended very specifically. So <clears throat> get that out. Wait, do that one. We don't want to be saying intended. We really want to focus on initial because sometimes the initial receiver is not the person that the passer intended the ball to go to. Okay. There you go. Um, let's see. <laughs> James, the stream might be an hour for you. Okay. That's not two times speed. That's slow speed. Okay. So let me know what other questions you have on that. The other thing that Alex brought up in the discord was whether that interceptor then should be given five meters in which to control the ball and to be on the ground. Getting a little meta, a little inception here. So I get it, but what, what you can think about in this situation is if we go back to that, Dawson, okay, we're going to go back to this. I'm going to mute the scene so that. I can actually talk over it and wait up here. Okay. So as we look at this again, look at the mechanics of what actually happens when an interceptor receives the ball. Okay. If they are doing so in a safe manner, they are going to be in ample space. 
So the protection, as it were, that, that ability to receive safely and get it on the ground is already built into the fact that they were able to receive in that kind of space. Does that make sense? Like just logically speaking, it's going to be there. That said, only the initial receiver is entitled to a five meter controlled space, a five meter, you know, zone as it were. Okay. So you're, the, the interception has to be done safely and th their, it's their responsibility to control it. Does that make sense? Um, let's see. Florian, what happens when the initial receiver is intercepted with less than five meters and I call it before? You call it before what? Before it happens? Either they're intercepting safely and you, you wait for the, that interception to be happening safely or what you have is a five meter infringement and you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been able to call that earlier anyway. Okay. I know we are going through mental gymnastics. I wasn't kidding in the description when I said we were going to jump around and flip and that sort of thing, but you really have to be careful and think. And this is why I keep showing the aerial situations because when you look at it, you say, well, this happens and then this happens and then this happens. It's a sequential thing. So you, if you think about it in the abstract and start using words, you can get yourself very, very confused and make it a lot more complicated than it really is. Let me know if that answered the question, Florian, because I'm not sure if I explained that as clearly as I could have. I'll wait to see what happens. So just going back to Stefan's comment here or his question, the, the dangerous interceptions should go in general to the initial receiver. Absolutely. Just in case I didn't really isolate that down. Okay. Now, what you're going to need at your level of play in order for there to be safe interceptions is you're going to need aerials that are either long enough and high enough that a player can anticipate and say, oh, I see where this is landing. I'm going to be able to get in that place and probably be taking it over their head. Okay. Because if the ball is going lower than that, then, you know, you're, you're in, in much more of the danger territory than you would otherwise, if that makes sense. Okay. So so it's going to be a longer and higher aerial. And the player is going to need to have the skill to be able to take that out of the air. Everything else, you don't have the skills required in the execution of that skill at that level that interceptions can occur. Like they're just not going to happen. James, I don't like even providing the initial receiver five meter space drawn as a circle around them if... We're not using that to also determine if the initial receiver in five meter space in the, in the first place. Oh, James, you get so confusing on me. Let me see if I can figure this out. Yeah, sorry. I don't understand what you're saying there. I've, I've read it a couple times now and I don't get it. So maybe you can say it another way for me, James. Okay. So for those of you who are umpiring at the higher levels that you're going to be seeing these attempts happen, I hope that makes it clear enough. You may be in a situation like Alex, where your association is actually taking these particular examples and taking the FIH brief briefing and putting it in front of their membership and saying, this is what we're doing. This, this is binding now. And even if not, this is how the mandate from the top level, the international level, it needs to start filtering down. Okay. And again, I'm fairly certain that the wide range that I umpire at, that I am only going to see safe interceptions on rare occasions at the higher levels. Otherwise, the, the, the anticipation isn't there, the vision isn't there, and the skills aren't there. 
Okay, so I hope that helps. All right, I will come back if you ask more questions on that. But the next one I wanted to go to was diving. So let me just see. I have to get to the correct slide again. Do, do, do. Okay. So we talked about this during the Olympic broadcasts and the Talking Tokyo live streams that we did exclusively in Discord. So that's another good reason to get over to Discord is because it gives me an opportunity to be able to talk about clips that I can't talk about on the social medias. And um, so this is coming into the game and we're going to need to start addressing it. So before I get into that, let me just make sure I've got James's clarification here on the aerial question. A player standing three meters in front of an opponent receives the ball safely in front of them, then turns and wants a penalty because the player behind them is within five meters. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound to me like the player who's three meters in front who receives it. That person's the initial receiver. So <laughs> I, I don't. I don't understand the, um, the flip on that one. Stefan. So the safe interception example, if Eddie did not get the ball propelled in front of him and went towards the Dutch player, would be a free hit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think what you're saying, Stefan, is you're wondering if the, if the interceptor mishandles the ball because that would be a mishandle. That would not be a, I want the ball to go towards my opponent who I'm trying to intercept the ball from. You, you want to keep the ball away from them. So that's a mishandling of it. Would it be a foul? Would you need to award a free hit to the initial receiver who got intercepted when the ball gets played at them? Um, if that contributes to dangerous play, yes. But... The interceptor might just play the ball down onto the ground and it lands at their feet. And now, the, but they're, they're not going to be in a close distance where there's a contest of the ball in the air. But if the interceptor deflects it and it's in a, in a range where dangerous play could occur towards that initial receiver, the, the, the Dutch player, then that's dangerous play and it would be a free hit defense just as, as of that. Okay. I hope that helps. Cool. 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 Okay. Here it is. So diving, like I said, we talked about this in talking Tokyo. This was first put into the Euro briefing again. So this isn't the first time that some of the umpires had seen this. But at the Euro Championships that were in June and <laughs> James, I think 2,000 characters would be too restrictive for you. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, so this was in the Euro European Championship briefing, now in the Tokyo briefing, and it's going to be something that's going to stay. So this is a concern going forward in our game because we've been seeing it coming in at the top levels, okay? This is the example that they show here. It's so difficult when you've got an opponent who is quicker than you, you start lining up for a tackle. By the time you actually execute the tackle, you then realize that you're just a meter away from where you... Okay, I'll just show it one more time it's here. It's so difficult when you've got an opponent who is quicker than you, you start lining up for a tackle. By the time you actually execute the tackle, you then realize that you're... Just a so I'm going to, I'm going to show it back because it's really hard to see with the distance they've given it, but what the, what the comment says here is about look to be in a position to see the spacing between the players. So to actually detect whether there's contact or not. And that's one example of a dive that could have been detected. In, if you are the back umpire, if you are the controlling umpire to which the 
uh, play is coming towards you, you don't have a good angle on this. Just like you can't, you can't see five meters on a free hit. You can't see five meters on an aerial from there. That has to be the umpire who's supporting and who is on the other side of the play so that they can actually detect how much contact was actually made in that situation. An example that I pulled out, and let's see if I've got it. Yeah, it should be Trying here. Trying to get him up the touchline as far as they can so they can get his feet around it and then deliver cross-field passes using that whip drag that he really likes. Okay. It's very subtle. It's not even talked about by the commentators. Trying to get him up the touchline I'm sorry, as far subtle as, as they can. So they subtle can is the wrong word because there's deliver. nothing subtle about what happened there. But... What you have in in that situation is a demonstration and a request for a foul or something worse, I maybe, I guess, when there is very, very, very little contact made. What's interesting about this, and I noted it during the European Championships, and we talked about it a lot in Talking Tokyo, it wasn't called once. So there could have been a couple in the pool play, but as things got closer to the crunch moments and we saw, a, for me, I saw two in the bronze medal game that could have been called. But in that situation, it was highly unlikely, <laughs> highly unlikely that any umpire would step up in that situation and say, well, this is going to be the history-making moment where the very first card for diving is going to be given. So somebody's going to have to break the ice. It's going to be controversial when it happens. I predict that we're going to see it in the pro league and we're going to see it sooner than later because it's easier to do it in a, in a lesser pressure situation, but you have the players at the caliber who are going to be trying it on and we can set the precedent. So what, what I find is interesting about this is that the, the process that's happened with the top umpires is at first they're like, we don't have to call this. This never happens. To, oh, gee, it just happened like six times in the same tournament. Now who's going to do it first? That's going to happen to you at your level as well, if there is any of this in your game. And, <clears throat> excuse me, only you would be able to, you know, to give me an honest answer as to whether you you would have any of that at your level but if it happens this is what you need to know it's not a foul okay so this isn't something in the rule book that you can point at and say oh 9.10 thou shalt not foul uh dive thou, sh thou shalt not dive and call a free hit against the player for doing so Okay, it is not an action that disadvantages an opponent. It's a form of dissent. And in the same way that dissent or appealing isn't in the rule book, other than in the objectives and, you know, that back part of the rule book that I hate, as you all know, there, there actually isn't a foul for appealing to an umpire or abusing an umpire, dissenting with an umpire. It's not a foul, but it is a form of misconduct. And our jurisdiction, our ability to award personal penalties for misconducts all rest underneath that general rubric. Okay. So what you would do in that situation where no foul was called, the play on continued, sorry, in that situation, I mean the one that was actually um, here where the uh, defender on the ball made the big remonstration as I play it again. Um, well, the, oh, sorry, that, that one was given. I got the wrong example in my Trying head. Trying to get him up the touchline as far as they the can. That so they can I get showed. And then deliver cross this one here. Okay, this was just a play on situation. This is something that you wouldn't then award a free hit to the ball carrier for. You would just allow the play on to continue and then you would come back to this just like you would with an appeal at the next stoppage in play and give the card. 
Okay. The one thing that I find interesting about this clip in particular is that I feel that's obstruction. And we have to be at least empathetic enough to understand that if a player is making a really big deal out of and possibly exaggerating the result of them being disadvantaged by a foul by an opponent, we have to be big enough and empathetic enough to ask ourselves, did we miss something that we should have actually awarded the foul to? It doesn't excuse the dissenting, appealing, misconduct, diving behavior. It doesn't. But what I, I, I still want us to, to not get into the framework of an us against them enemy, them doing the wrong things, but to be in the game enough and in the mindset of service, serving the game properly, that we are going to see these moments as a possible feedback mechanism for us. Okay. Are we watching football? Yep. We can all say this, and this is what's happening is that the the things that we've been starting to see coming into the top levels of our game on these, uh, in these, in these big games where there's a lot on the line is, is yeah, exactly what we, you would see in football in that other sport that I do not like to talk about. And it's really important for us as a sport to not let this horse leave the barn. Football did. And now look at them. I can't watch it. I can't watch it. I didn't grow up watching it. I try to watch it. Women's is better. So I was able to watch one game at the Olympics and it was the women's final because Canada won it and that was cool. But men's, not a chance. I can't watch that stuff. Zero interest. And I understand that your your cultural norms have acclimatized you to seeing it, hating it, but still appreciating the rest of the sport for somebody like me, I can't, I can't watch it. Um, and then, uh, uh Stefan, you also asked, you were going to ask if the, if the attacker is obstructing the defender there. And yeah. And, and what, what you're seeing here in this play is that the attacker continues to move the ball in the same direction while blocking with his leg. So the leg and the ball are going in the same direction. And I mean, it's just very much, yeah. Okay. So not every example that you ever get shown of these things are just a black and white. Yeah. One player is in the wrong and, and we need to penalize it. There's a lot that goes into these things. And there are, are yeah, there, there's room for gray here. We can talk about the gray. Okay. I'm interested in knowing from you guys, is this something that you've ever seen at your level before that you've umpired and you wished you had or felt like you were empowered to deal with it? Uh, Another example of diving that we saw was the, uh, in the EHL, EHL? No, it was just the Dutch hoofed class final. And I did a few I, I've talked about this on What Up Wednesdays. I've done a YouTube short on it. And I will link in the description or put a card up here as well in one of these places where a uh, stick was pushed slash thrown slash thrust into the midsection of another player in retaliation for a tackle. And the player who took the stick in his midsection tumbled to the ground as if he were shot. And that, I think that was the catalyst. That was the one moment that that put it on the radar of the rules committee. So good job, Brinkman. And now we're, they're watching for it. And they said, oh, this is starting to happen. Let's get this in the briefing so that we can deal with it. And it's up to us as umpires to follow the mandate. So do you think this is going to happen for you? I don't know. Frankly, at any of the levels I play with, play with play, uh, umpire at and that sort of thing, I don't think I'm going to see it. 
it's just not there's just not enough reward for the reputation penalty that a, a player would take I think for for doing that kind of thing and it does take a high level of skill to dive like I'm not I'm not saying that cheating can't be skillful it's just the kind of skill we're not rewarding <laughs> as umpires nope okay so it doesn't seem like any of you are thinking that you're going to be seeing this in your games, but hey, it's going to be a topic of conversation. It's going to be something the first time it gets called, it's going to be all over the internets, it, all over the hockey internets at least, and <laughs> get ready because it's coming up in the next six months, I predict it. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go on to the last question which is from talk hockey radio host umpire and photog about town simon webb asking first of all if i'm fine and dandy and thank you i am indeed um how to handle his question is how do i handle umpire coaches that i strongly disagree with so an example for him a uh, regional coach and assessor that He's aware of, still insists you stand still when doing a signal, do the signal hold, take it down, and then move. And he notes, I don't think I see any FIH or MPUA do that aside from when the signal stops play, such as a PC or stroke. How do you manage the political game and disagree while keeping them on side? Um, it's, it's a confidence issue, obviously, as he says, but this could be critical as you move up the levels of play. So I want to know from you, have you been in this situation before and what you've done to handle it? Because I certainly have. Okay. And I have just come through, um, a situation with umpires who are aware of, I am aware of, and there's an umpire who recently traveled to a tournament and was doing the modern positioning and did not get good feedback from their umpire managers at that tournament because they don't know the modern positioning. And that put that umpire in the situation where they had been training and practicing something that they found to be very beneficial, very advantageous to their game, helped them be more accurate, helped cut down on unnecessary running and, and all that kind of stuff. But just sheerly for the fact that it didn't look right to those umpire, to, to that umpire manager or managers, they had to consider their strategy as to what they were going to do to change it. Part of what, what I'm trying to promote when we talk in these live streams is the critical thinking process where we understand the why behind what we do. So we spend a lot of time and I spend a lot of time defending a concept with really seemingly sort of esoteric or very analytical concepts. Like, well, the reason that, for example, I think it's important to be ahead of the play and to be backpedaling prior to the big moments to get yourself in position is because by keeping yourself open to the play where your shoulders are open and you are able to see everything around you without having to look over your head, that gives you the best vision on the ball possible. So if I got a good argument back as to saying why running away from the play and looking over one's shoulder is better, I want to hear it. I want to know the why behind that advice. I've never heard a good why as to why that old style is preferable for that situation. And it doesn't mean that specific umpiring techniques or strategies are never going to have cons associated with their pros. But by engaging in these dialogues, we develop a method for coming up with the best ways, the best strategies. And one of the influencing factors for me in approaching umpiring education this way has been learning from coaches. So I have 
attended a number of FIH Academy courses as just sort of like a, I guess an auditor, you can call it. I don't feel like I'm auditing. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm an observer more. And listening to how the top coaches in the world talk about the process of learning with their team and the dialogue learner centric coaching that the players develop their whys, they develop their understanding critically of why they take certain approaches and they take ownership of strategy and technique and all these things. It's like we have this massive untapped resource of people who actually do the thing that we're coaching. And if we don't involve them in a dialogue, we are losing out particularly on our own learning and we're missing out on really getting those, the people who are coaching to understand what they're trying to achieve and how they can go about that. So when I heard about this whole learner centric aspect of, of sport, I looked at umpiring and I thought, holy crap, we do not do that at all. Like it is crazy to the extent that it's very didactic very prescriptive umpire managers and coaches will say, this is how I learned how to umpire. This is how we're going to do it and sit out there and evaluate and assess and appoint people on the basis of what they think of what, how they learned it by rote. And then applying that, that, uh, that tactic, that technique, that strategy, to the people that they are there to coach. And I'm trying to flip that on its head. It doesn't mean that it's happening for a lot of people. The issue is communication and networking and people, umpire coaches and managers develop, developing themselves in their fields. So instead of just being content with how they've always done it before, if they're not attending seminars, if they're not listening to live streams, if they're not engaging in discussions on the internet, they are not growing. And this kind of approach is going to be extremely foreign and difficult. So let's talk about a few things that we can do to make this better. Okay. When we're in these situations, because it's going to happen, you're going to be in the situation and it's going to be hard. Uh, James, yeah, I've been taken off games at tournaments for applying the rules instead of what the UMs and TDs incorrectly said were the rules. That is, yeah, (laughs) yeah, wow, 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 just tough. David Hughes, just ask for another coach. Okay, kind of. So that that's that's one of the one of the strategies. But first of all, one of the ways in which we as umpires can address this relationship is to recognize that we are participants in that relationship. We're not just subjects. So your umpire managers, your umpire coaches should, and assessors, should be interested in developing that relationship with you beforehand. So sitting down and talking with somebody you're going to work with and say, hey, This is what I'm thinking. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm working on. These are the things that I've tried. This is what's working for me. This isn't what's working for me. What do you think? You are all here, all here in a What Up Wednesday because you are highly, highly motivated and dedicated umpires. And you are applying more care and attention to your craft than probably... 98% of the umpiring population. Okay. You guys are really special. Good job. And by taking that initiative, it's one of those things that's really hard as a, as a coach or an umpire to be like, what do you mean? No, no, I will not listen to you. I will not work with you. I will not You know, because those umpire managers and coaches should be there because they are also passionate about improving and that sort of thing. But maybe they just haven't been exposed to a concept before. Maybe they haven't heard about this. Maybe they don't know that it's even out there because they've been a little cut off from the community. 
maybe the avenues of communication from the higher levels aren't in place in your area. And it's one of the things that we work on trying to change with FH umpires, but there are challenges in a lot of areas. So being proactive and sitting down with your person, getting on a WhatsApp, getting on a Zoom, texting them, whatever, having establishing contact and relationship and a process can do wonders for that. And so that's why it's part of a lot of associations practices that you do actually, you're, you're told you got to make contact before, uh, your game that you're going to be working with somebody in. Okay. So I think that's an, a really important first step because you are now setting the table instead of just sitting back and accepting what that umpire coach or manager might do on their own without any, and I don't mean challenge in the way that you're like, I challenge you. No, it's a challenge in terms of let's, let's be active about the process we're going to go through together. Does that make sense? When you get into a situation where you're working with, you've, you've worked with an umpire coach or an umpire manager who you do not agree on certain things on is you need to start going up the hierarchy. Okay. And do so in a way that you are, um, you know, you, you have to do it diplomatically. And the first thing you, you do is you start off with your peers. And that's what something that we do here with FH umpires a lot is that people run it by like, Hey, what do you think? You know, you're, you're just like me. You're doing stuff like me. How do you do it in your area? Is, am I on drugs? And I, and I, <laughs> I use that phrase, uh, quite often, like, in, am I insane? Do you, is what I'm thinking straight? Because sometimes you'll get that feedback from your peers going, where did you get that from? That's not a thing that doesn't exist. That positioning, you know, who taught you that? Cause that's weird. That, that doesn't seem to accord. So you, sometimes you'll get that kind of feedback and be able to make that adjustment. And you yourself as an umpire still need to be open to that kind of feedback as well. Okay. That it's every time you're going to be learning from all this. And there is the possibility that something's changed or you misunderstood a message or the person who gave you that message was simply mistaken. So start with your peers, make sure that you, you know, you're, you're where you think you need to be and you understand your whys you've gone through the, that intellectual process. And then you start going up and up and you say with your association, Hey, I worked with this, uh, this particular umpire coach and we differed on this approach. What is the standard and why is the standard that way? Because you might be in a place where there's a number of people who are all perhaps advising something that's outdated just because they haven't had any of that information coming in. And it's not something for blame. It doesn't mean that somebody's terrible. It doesn't mean that they're lazy. It doesn't mean that they're too old to do their job, but it's an issue of communication. I believe really strongly that people strive to do the right thing if the communication is right. So the information has to be offered and it needs to be heard and it needs to be accepted. And at the end of the day, when we put the service of the game at the highest priority, we can make the changes to improve the way that we umpire the game together as a group and make changes all throughout. Okay. So I hope that those are two things that help. When your association gets that kind of feedback about a particular umpire manager or coach or a group, then they can set a process in place where, okay, we need to educate ourselves and we need to figure out what's going on. We all need to get on the same page. And that should be the same page that the parent organization of that is on. Because again, I talk all the time about starts at the top and it should all filter its way down. Okay. And sometimes there's disconnects. So some, somebody in the, in the middle, maybe not on the right level, but has heard it from the top over here, but there's some disconnects. It's like, okay, how do we build that back up again? So we need to take it up and up and up until we get to the correct message. And then we can filter it back down again. Okay. I think I just out of focused my camera. 
Um, let's see, Stefan, this is good advice. Good. Reflecting and rebounding feedback to think of your understanding is the right perspective. Yes. It's an active process and we all have different ways of, I'm not going to say we have different, I don't believe in things like I'm a visual learner and I'm an auditory learner. No, nah, that, that, that stuff doesn't exist, but we do have different patterns in our brain that have been created by our experiences throughout our lifetime, educational, vocational, personal, all that kind of stuff where certain words have different meanings. We've associated them with different parts of our brains and little neurons and pathways and stuff like that. And sometimes when you hear something explained in a different way, I might say the words, we're balancing the scales of justice here. And that just goes oh, for you. It's like, that's, yes, I get that. I've explained something with those words that you've probably heard a million times before, but just not expressed in exactly that way. So it didn't click in your brain. And likewise, I can use phrases that don't accord at all with the way that your brain works. And you're going to say, I don't get it. What's that about? And that's why we need to work with many different coaches in many different environments so we can find what works for us and helps our brains. Simon, if you're here, I'd like to know, did that help at all? I know it can be frustrating, but think of it this way. We as an umpiring fraternity, sorority group, community, God, I hate the word fraternity. As an umpiring community or family, we simply have started this journey into new or burgeoning coaching practices late. That's it. Later than the players have. But the approaches work, doing things collaboratively, letting umpires driving the discussion talking amongst ourselves, developing an accord, coming to a consensus, trying things out, understanding that there's more than one way to do things. All those things are going to come more and more into umpiring practice because it is the only way we can catch up to what's happening in the game. Hi, Eric. Good to see you, friend. Eric is one of my non-hockey people friends from Austria. Good to see you. Okay, it did. Your, your kids are trying to type. <laughs> so you put the keyboard out of reach. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very much worked for me, worked for you right now. And that's one of the reasons that we try to get newer blood into our communities, into positions of authority, right? It's just so easy when you've been somewhere in, in a position. And I've, I've been saying to people who know me closely, I said, like, as soon as, as soon as I'm showing signs of being too rigid in my thinking, you know, take me out back. Um, but it, it, it's, it's easier or it has been easier in the past as we age in our sports to get a little bit, no, nah, this is, this is the way it's always been done and the way it's always going to be. Times are moving so fast now. Information is getting thrown in our faces at rates that we never could have understood would have happened 20 years ago. And we have to understand that it's this whole, this isn't about umpiring, this is about culture and the way in which we understand authority, the way we share knowledge. These are bigger concepts than just whether something, whether a ball is dangerous or not. And it all interrelates and connects. And so what feels like could be in that moment, like this is going to ruin my career. This one game is terrible. How am I going to possibly deal with this? Just take a step back and realize there's a much bigger picture shift going and, and that things are going to move big. They're going to move on a grand scale around you in a way that you might not feel it in your particular singular experiences in a one game setting with one coach and that sort of thing. Okay. I'm starting to get very, yeah. As soon as I start doing this kind of motion, I know that I'm getting quite big picture with 
with conversations, but that's all I can say in order to try to help reduce your frustration. I know what it's like because I've been there a lot. And again, we just need to take a step back. Okay, how can we address this on a system level? How can we get the association on side? Because it's not about a person. It is not individual. It's not It's not an issue with with one. It is how we address this as a community, as a sport, as an officiating group. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully it is starting to shift. Okay. If you have any other questions for me, slip them in now because I have about, I usually go for a Keeley hour, which is 90 minutes, but I'm trying to be more efficient in, uh, in time these days and not try to do too much to respect your time as well. So if you have anything else for me, if anything came up with your, um, in your games this past weekend, if you started getting back to friendlies and that sort of thing, if not, I'm going to be in the discords, uh, for the next, uh, Yeah, for the next hour for sure, I'm going to be right there ready to answer your questions. Come join us and take a poke around. If you are already a green or yellow member, then make sure you answer the little survey and say, yes, I need my green roll or my yellow roll so that you can see things in the Discord that are particular to you because there are special places with special conversations. I can't click on them because then I'd be like, you know, exposing things. Don't want to do that. So come over to the discords and, and and this is a continuing community process. So, um, if you can't make it right now, that's fine. We're here all, all, all the time. There'll be so many. Okay. Here's a question from Simon, maybe half beat. Oh, hang on. Wait, Rachel. League starts on Saturday. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Sound effects. Yeah, I I actually, I've been able to umpire a couple times over the last two weeks and I've been, it's been really nice. It's just, I, I've missed it so much. The pandemic took so much out of that real life experience and, and uh, I can't wait to get out there. So I really feel that when you say I'm so excited about season starting, I'm like, I know I can feel it in my gut. So I hear you, Rachel. I hear you. Um, let's see when I am part in the UK, did I have anything strike you, strike me as really weird, um, about their, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> tons, tons was weird. And I had to come into the MPUA. So this Simon's referring to, um, from 2006 to 2012, I came over to the UK and umpired for a few months at a time. And then I would go home. So I basically did like a fall session and a winter session. And once I did an indoor season. And so I was, I was there for about five months of every year and came home in the interim. And the learning curve for me, for the way that things are done differently over in England was incredibly steep. Like, oh my gosh, it was so intense. And I could have said to myself, like, oh, this is wrong. Because this isn't the way that we do it in Canada. But I really took on that learner mindset. Like, I'm going to try everything. I'm going to see what works. And you know, and yeah, and just give everything a fair shot, go through the process, understand the why. But this was also a a stage in my career where I was very much just trying to do everything I could to get to the next level. So I wasn't really a critical thinker at that point. I really wasn't. I didn't have that capacity yet. So this is something that I've been developing, something that, you know, doesn't just, it's not just instantaneous. So that was another thing is I kind of did everything that I was told. Um, One challenge that I did have was that I started at the bottom of the National League 
And even though I was an FIH promising list on par at the time, I wasn't given a lot of respect. Let's put it that way. So I had umpire coaches and managers working with me who kind of assumed that I wasn't going to be very good. And at times I wasn't. (laughs) So they weren't wrong all the time. But there was a bit of a bias that I had to work through. And that might be something that you guys experience as well, is that people say, oh, you're from that region. You've done that league. You don't really... That's not very helpful, is it? It's not gainful, and it just doesn't give anybody any room to show their true capabilities. But anyway, that was something that I kind of fought through a little bit. And um, when I when I got to the level where I was working with, you know, the the, the national panel on the prem panel umpires and and the Prem umpire managers and coaches and the other FIH people. Every, I was just, I was learning so much from everyone. It was truly, truly a good experience. But that was probably the only thing that I really had to struggle with in terms of what happened on the pitch. Off the pitch, it was craziness. It was chaos. I had no idea what was happening. But on the pitch, yeah, that was probably it. Um, let's see. Yes, and special people in the Discord, absolutely. You're very welcome, Ian. And you have a good week too, sir. We have secret handshakes that are like, I was like, is that eyes and a nose or is that a secret handshake? No, that's eyes and a nose. Okay. Stefan, the last couple of weeks of the season for you, looking at getting some indoor going. Yes. Yeah, indoor is going to be interesting. We're in the same position, Stefan, um, because we in Calgary play indoor from October through March. Every year, six months of indoor. It's pretty crazy. And we only got to play three weeks last year before. So we got it going in November and then we got shut down for the second wave, second wave going into Christmas and December. So we're making our plans for indoor right now and fingers crossed that we're going to be able to get there and have a good indoor season. But... We're in a fourth wave right now in Alberta, my province, in Calgary, where we have the worst caseload of COVID in the entire country because we have a whole lot of people who don't believe in vaccinations. And we have governmental leadership who thinks that we should have reopened in the summer. No restrictions, no tracing, no nothing. And lo and behold, we have, yeah, just just the worst. Full ICU capacity the whole bit, it's really terrible. So I'm trying to stay positive and not think about anything like that. Uh, James, you're jealous of people who are starting. Yours has been officially abandoned again. Oh, yeah, because you're going through some times, some definite times. But you do have an online indoor course coming up. That is great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope this actually, there's a way in which it might be counterintuitive that indoor is going to be more difficult to carry off um, than outdoor because it is less safe from a COVID perspective. However, if your region has gotten to the point where you can play safely indoors, this might actually be a real boon to the indoor game because people are saying, well, I didn't get to play outdoor. I didn't get to out- umpire outdoor. And I really miss the game. I miss my people. I miss my family. So I'm going to go play indoor when I normally wouldn't. And I would have tried something else. So I hope that this actually ends up being a bit of a boon for indoor. That would be good. Um, let's see. Stefan's wondering uh, that James is in Melbourne. Stefan, you're trying to get it going in Wellington. Yeah, there you go. Um, I don't have a problem with being honest. And I'm always relatively speaking, so... But I'm, I'm okay with being self-critical. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I, I, I am not, I don't have a problem with failure. I don't have a problem with being bad. Look at me. I come in here live streaming every week and some of my shows, I listen back and I go, wow, that was not good. But everything is not, nothing goes to waste because if I don't succeed, I learn. So Knowing that I had so much improving to do when I was over in England, Niels, gave me the opportunity 
to learn all of that. If I'd gone in with the perception that I was, I was already good enough, I wouldn't have learned as much, not nearly as much. That's my, that's my jam. James, you remember your old association putting together an indoor team years ago because your state team wanted to do a tour and play against the regional teams. Oh, wow. You nobody who plays indoor. Crazy. Canada, obviously, is very different. <laughs> and, and areas of Europe. Um, they actually don't play out on the West Coast very much. They'll, they'll play like a couple weekends and that's about it. But like I said, six months in Calgary. We're pretty good at indoor. And that is actually going to be one of the things that hopefully Field Hockey Canada is looking at from a high per performance perspective of bringing the indoor um, program to centralize here because we have the facilities, we have the season, all that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping that Calgary becomes a bit of a center for indoor hockey in the country. That would be dope. And <laughs> you weren't able to keep playing after halftime. Eh, maybe it did work out so well. Who knows? There you go. So despite all that and some people getting shut down and some people looking forward to indoor and then some people just starting their outdoor seasons, we're all in this together, gang. And I really enjoyed having all of you here with me today. Uh, tell your friends, tell your fellow umpires to come join in on the What Up Wednesday Come over to the Discord, get to know me, get to know everybody else in the community because this is about us being able to network and come together and support each other. This is all about the support and it's, I think, made such a, an incredible difference for all of us throughout the pandemic times and the pandemic times that are continuing for all of us. So do not be shy. Tell everybody about it. Stefan, you played growing up indoor in the 80s and 90s in your hometown it was awesome but oh it died a death I thought oh god somebody died uh it died a death in New Zealand you've been asked to send a team to the world cup so you hope to bring it up yeah there you go and that's the joy that these big events bring they bring visibility to the sport at that level so yeah <laughs> Niels now smash the like button yeah if you haven't before you do it now YouTube's gonna go that person made a very very deliberate decision here they did not rush into things thank you so much you know and sometimes it can feel really daunting but it just takes a few people to get the ball rolling and get over the inertia and then boom you're gonna have an indoor season so I'm really looking forward to supporting you with that Stefan because we've we've talked on Discord, again, another good part about Discord, you can talk to me directly about things like this and uh, what we're going to start talking about what we can do to support you in Wellington to get your indoor going. So, oh, there was a like. I just saw it. I just saw the thumb go whoop up my screen. So thank you very much who did that. Uh, next week, I don't know what we're going to talk about. So you should send your questions to me just like Simon did. You can do it on the socials, but the Discord is great. You can message me on WhatsApp if you have my number already. You can send me an email at keely at fhumpires.com. I would love to hear what you would like me to talk about as you are jumping into your season or maybe looking for some advice of what to, you can do in your off season to best prepare you for what hopefully will be your next season coming up. So let's have a talk about that. Thanks so much for joining in. It was great to see you all. And we will, as Stefan's giving me the, the smiley wave, we will see you on the next What Up Wednesday and see you in the Discord. Bye for now.